and it's good to see you on this beautiful Lord's Day. Uh, we're going to start our service today uh, with uh, hymn number 417, Faith of Our Fathers, which is sort of tradition for us to sing this on Father's Day. We're thankful for our Heavenly Father and for all the godly fathers and the roles that you have in your families that God has given to you. Nathan's going to come uh, and lead us in our hymn. And we do stand as we sing and remain standing as we have prayer after our hymn. Let's stand together, 417 year hymns. <laughs> Father, we pray for 
those who cannot be with us, those who are sick, uh, battling various illnesses, that you would minister to them. May your grace sustain them in the time of need. And Father, we pray for those without Christ, whether family members that we have or friends or even those we don't even know. We know the world needs Jesus, and he is the only answer. So we pray that you would help us in all of our efforts to evangelize the world as Jesus has commanded us so that they can know the joy and peace of knowing the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 13. I'll read the first 10 verses, and you should be able to see them on the screen uh, behind me if you don't have your Bible. Uh, John chapter 13, the first 10 verses. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands, and that he was come from God, and went to God, he riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. We thank the Lord for his word at this time. The men are going to come for our uh, tithes and offerings, and they will be passing the plates, but you don't have to take them and pass it. They will be coming to you. Uh, this allows us to have uh, offertory music as we worship and listen to the song. Kelly has our offertory today, uh, and you'll see the words to her song on the screen uh, as well. And I'm going to ask uh, Vaughn Tomlinson, would you ask God's blessing on our gifts this morning? Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful for your mercy and your love that you show forth to us every day and all the comfort and opportunity that we have to be able to assemble in your house today to worship you and to study the word together. And we just uh, pray that uh, our worship and singing and, and praise will give you all to you. So we do thank you for the Father uh, that you uh, provided and Lord, we just pray your blessing upon each one of them. And so we just pray that they would be a godly influence in their home. We just uh, thank you for your good and bless us and thank you for the uh, opportunity to give back a portion of what you've given to each one of us. And Lord, we just pray that you take these gifts and offers and that you use them for your honor and for your glory. So we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
sins upon courts, glorified the name. Aren't you glad we have a perfect heavenly Father? Lord, try to <laughs>
Thank the Lord for his wonderful love for us. The welcome verse you see on the screen there is from our text tonight as we study the book of uh, Isaiah on Sunday evenings. But as we come to this verse where it says, The Father to the children shall make known thy truth. That we're so appropriate to use this morning and this evening as well on Father's Day, uh, recognizing that it, as fathers it's our responsibility to make sure the truth of the Word of God is known to our families and children and grandchildren as well. We come to John chapter 13 as we've been going through the book of John in our Sunday morning messages. <clears throat> and we're to that passage of scripture, <clears throat> excuse me, where Jesus washed the disciples' feet there. And as we look at this this morning, we're going to see three simple things. We'll see, first of all, Christ's love. And I'm glad that we just had a song about that. Then we're going to look at Peter's lack. And then Christ's lessons from this story of <clears throat> washing the disciples' feet. First of all, as we look at Christ's love, as he tells us that, in verse 1, it says, When the feast of Passover uh, was over, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end there. And so he was getting ready to depart out of the world. He knew why he came into the world. He came into the world to go to the cross and die and save sinners. For all the world uh, is sinners there. And his love brought him into the world. Uh, and he was the lamb for the Passover. It talks about the Passover. Before the feast of the Passover, he knew that he came to be the lamb of God to be slain for the sins of the world. And yet that was the motivation, uh, his love there. And so as we look at the love of Christ and the love of God, uh, four things about his love in this passage. There are many, many more things about the love of God. But in this passage we're studying, we see, first of all, that his love is unchanging. It says, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And that's really what love is. A love that doesn't love all the way to the end might be infatuation or something else other than love. But God's love, the agape love of the Bible, is a love of commitment. It is not a feeling uh, there. It's not a mood that someone goes uh, through. It is indeed a uh, commitment. So in our society, when you hear people talking about, well, we just don't love each other anymore uh, there. Uh, well, they don't have that feeling towards each other anymore there because love doesn't end. Love is a commitment, and that's why in a marriage ceremony there's this commitment of I do and the promise there. And Jesus had that love that was a committed love. It says he loved them unto the end. Was it always easy on Jesus? Of course, we know it wasn't. He was persecuted. He was crucified. And even though he was mistreated, he was abused, he was rejected, uh, he had the verbal assaults, the physical assaults. None of that stopped him from loving. His love cannot be quenched at all. It is unchanging there. And so I'm glad that his love is always the same. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so his love never changes. And I mentioned it's also unquenched by evil. And we see that in verse 2 with Judas there. It says that Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, was to betray him. And Jesus loved Judas. He loved him in spite of his evil, in spite of the fact that he would betray him, because the love that God has for us is not dependent on us doing everything that he tells us to do and being obedient all the time. And if we do what's right, he'll love us. And if we don't do what's right, he won't love us. That's not the case at all. He loves us through it all. Now, he doesn't accept and approve everything we do, but he never stops loving us. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, listen as I read those two verses about the love of God. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, principalities, or powers, nor things present or things to come, nor height nor depth, 
nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the love that God has for us is demonstrated in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says none of those things can separate us from the love of God. He, in those verses he says there's nothing in the world that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing out of the world that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing above the world that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing below the world that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing before the world began or nothing after the world has been. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Now that doesn't mean that God excuses sins because we're talking about Judas. God continued to love him. Jesus continued to love him. Even though he betrayed him, the love of God did not stop. Where's Judas today? Well, we know from the teaching of Scripture, when it says he went to his own place, uh, he is lost without Christ, and he is in hell. So don't misunderstand. Just because the love of God never changes and the love of God is unquenched doesn't mean that because of the love of God, everybody's going to heaven. And so God loves us, but we must, by faith, receive him as Savior. If not, then we have rejected the love of God and must pay the consequences for our sins, even as Judas did. And so he loves us. There's nothing we can do to stop him from loving us, but we must receive his son. The love of God is in Christ Jesus. And it was demonstrated. Romans 5 8 said, God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, not only is it unquenched, we see the love of God is unselfish. In verse 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God. He came from God. He was in heaven. And we read about the glories of heaven and the splendor of heaven and we try to imagine as best we can how wonderful it is, and we know it's going to be wonderful. That's where Jesus was. And he left all of that to come to earth. And what did he have to gain? Nothing. Because he didn't come to see what he could gain from coming from his Father in heaven to earth. He left everything because he did it for us. There was a lot that we could gain. And so we see that characteristic of love, that love is unselfish. So those who say, as I mentioned a moment ago, that we just don't love each other anymore, what they're saying is, my satisfaction in this relationship is not what it should be, what I want it to be. And so see the selfishness of that? And the love of God is always doing what is best for the one loved. And whenever we love one another, for what is in the best interest of my wife or my husband or for my children when I love because of what's in, the, in it for them and not what's in it for me. And that is a godly, agape love. And that's the way Jesus loved. Having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them to the end. His love didn't change. His love wasn't quenched. His love was unselfish. And we also see another thing about his love. It was unprecious. In verses 4 and 5, it tells us that he rises from supper and he girds himself uh, there to the towel. And after he poured water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet. Uh, all of them. He loved the disciples, every one of them. As I mentioned, even Judas. And here they were with different personalities. He loved Thomas. And what do we call him at times? Doubting Thomas. Uh, he loved Peter. We think about Peter denying the Lord. He loved Judas uh, there who betrayed uh, the Lord. And so he loves everyone there. And he doesn't show favoritism or partiality. He is unprejudiced in his love. And we should be the same thing as well. Just because God loves everyone doesn't mean that he approves of everything that they do. And so, therefore, if we're going to love like God does, we must love everyone because God loves them and do what is in their best interest. 
And sometimes what is in their best interest, that's what love does, remember, means to tell them that you're wrong. If you don't accept Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. That's genuine love. It's warning them about the danger to come. Now, we might be criticized for it. That's why the Bible says we speak the truth uh, and love here. And so we see that Jesus loves everyone. And we see that the Lord of glory became the servant of man. And that's love, isn't it? Uh, he stooped down and began to wash the disciples' feet. Remember over in Luke chapter 22, Jesus goes into the home of a Pharisee. And his name was Simon. And while he was there, uh, uh, there was a woman who came in and began to wash his feet uh, there. And we also read in Luke about the story of the disciples. They were quarreling. Uh, in Luke chapter 22, verses 21 to 27, they were having this argument. Jesus was talking to them about his death. And while he was talking about dying, they were over here arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And so here they were discussing, I'm going to be the greatest, you're going to be the greatest. So they were ready to fight for a trophy, but they weren't ready to fight for a towel. And so here Jesus stoops down and he picks up the towel and he humbles himself and he begins to wash their feet. Well, let's look at Peter's life. We see beginning at verse 6. He comes to Simon Peter. He was getting ready to wash Peter's feet. And Peter said, Warren, you're going to wash my feet? Uh, and, and notice this lack, first of all, was a lack of initiative. Peter didn't offer to say, Lord, let me wash your feet uh, there. And so we must take initiative to serve the Lord. It's wonderful when people are willing to do whatever they're asked to do. Whenever your children are obedient and they do what you ask them to do, they're willing to obey. We're willing to do what God commands us. But there's something even better than that. When we tell our children to clean their room or clean up the kitchen and they do it, and we're glad. But what about those times when we don't even ask and we go by and they've done it without even asking? Well, that shows initiative, and there's a deeper appreciation in us as parents. Well, so it is uh, with God uh, there. And as I was telling about the Pharisee Simon earlier, what Jesus said to him when this Pharisee was there and saw the woman with the uh, ointment there, alabaster box of ointment, and wiping uh, Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears, and, and Jesus said to Simon there, I came into your house, and, and you didn't wash my feet. I came into your house and you didn't greet me with the holy kiss or the custom of that day. I came into your house and, and you didn't anoint my head with oil. But here's this woman that she has done this uh, willingly. She has shown the initiative and done it. Well, Peter lacked in his initiative to serve the Lord at this particular time. Also, we see he lacked in his insight. He didn't understand what Jesus was doing. We see in verse 7, Jesus said to him, What I do, thou knowest not now. And so he didn't know exactly what Jesus was doing. Neither did all the other disciples understand exactly what Jesus was doing. Now, if all he were doing was washing feet, everybody would have known. Well, yeah, he's washing feet. We know what he's doing. But there was some significance to what he was doing. There were some lessons to what he was doing, and we're going to see those uh, in just a little bit. But there are three truths that Peter didn't understand. He didn't understand the truth of union and communion there. And so Jesus talks about being holy bathed or just washing your feet there. And in the scriptures, we have the truth about uh, the union of God with God it establishes a relationship. And the communion of God uh, establishes that fellowship. And we see that even in human families uh, there. That uh, James Davis is my father. No matter what I do, he's my father. Uh, during my uh, time growing up, there were obviously some times where I displeased him and I disobeyed him. It didn't stop him from being my father. It didn't break the union but it did break the communion. And Peter
Peter didn't understand that particular spiritual truth. Another truth he didn't understand was the sonship and the fellowship there. Now, the desire was there. I love Peter's desire in verse 9 after the Lord corrected him. He said, well, if that's the case, Lord, don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands and wash my head. Lord, I really want to have this fellowship. I want to have this communion uh, with you there. And it's a wonderful thing to have the zeal and the desire. But we also need to have knowledge. And so that's what we have is Jesus teaching them a lesson. He says, what I'm doing now you don't understand. But I'm going to teach you so that you can add some knowledge to your zeal and your desire. And the third thing he didn't understand was the spiritual truth of salvation and restoration, which has to do with cleansing uh, there. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jeremiah chapter 2 tells us that even lie so uh, want uh, clean the heart. Listen to these verses from Jeremiah 2. He said, Yet I have planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto thee? For though thou wash thee with neither and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord. So he says, You can't take soap and wash away your sin. Uh, the Bible talks about the Word of God is a cleansing agent. Just a few verses and parts of those verses to share with you before we move on to Christ's lessons. In Ephesians 5, 26, it says, With the washing of the water by the Word. John 15, 3 says, Ye are clean through the Word. Titus 3, 5 says, By the washing of regeneration. God's Word is a cleansing agent. Not the lie so, but God's word, as we read it and study it and memorize it and meditate on it, God's word begins to cleanse us. In 1 John, as I quoted earlier, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so Jesus is trying to teach them these different truths of the union, sonship, salvation, and the communion, fellowship, and restoration, what it takes there. As God's children, uh, we know that once that sonship is established and we are born into the family of God, that relationship is established. There's nothing we can do to change that relationship, just like there's nothing I can do to change the relationship with my father. But there's a lot I can do to change the communion and the fellowship uh, there uh, with uh, bad actions and sins. We can break that fellowship with God as well. So let's move on to the lessons uh, with what Jesus is teaching them. In verse 12, Jesus said, after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and was set down again, he said to them, here's the question he asked, know ye what I have done to you? And oftentimes lessons are really given with questions. Uh, God began that in the Garden of Eden. Uh, whenever he said, Adam, where art thou? It was a question. Uh, God knew where he was. And so Jesus is asking this question, do you understand what I have done to you? And he wants to teach them what he has done. Now, there are four secondary lessons that we're going to see. And then we're going to look at the primary lesson of the washing of the disciples' feet. One is humility. In verse 16, it says, I say unto you that the servant is not greater than his Lord. And being a servant is a wonderful thing for us as believers. Now, we don't naturally like being a servant. We like to be served. We like to have, you know, the breakfast in bed and all of that. I guess we do. It's you know, been a while. We don't usually do that. We're up and uh, going. But these things are nice. Being served. But here he says, having the humility to be a servant there. The servant is not greater than his Lord. I grew up in a church that, that practiced this uh, foot washing uh, there. They would do that a couple of times a year. And humility was one of the key components of instruction. They were saying that's why they do it, to teach humility uh, there. There's another lesson that we learned from this, and these are secondary lessons. And that's the lesson of 
forgiveness. And part of the restoring of fellowship with God and others is, is forgiveness. And the Bible teaches us that we can't be mad at someone and at odds with someone else and still be in right fellowship with God. He says, if you have a gift and you bring it to the altar and there you remember uh, that uh, your brother have all against you, go to your brother and make that right and then come and offer your gift. And so forgiveness is so vital in our human relationships as well as in our relationship uh, with God. We just can't be right with God. Uh, if a man say that he loves God and he doesn't love his brother whom he has seen, how can he say he loves God whom he has not seen? And so forgiveness is an important lesson that is being taught. The idea of service. Uh, and so here is Judas. He's unsaved. Here are the other 11. They're saved. And so our service as a believer is to the lost and also to the saved uh, there. And remember whenever the disciples were having that argument about who's going to be the greatest, you know? Remember what Jesus' answer was to them when they asked who's going to be the greatest? He said that he that is the least, he that serves the most. And this is so contrary to our worldly philosophy there. They measure success and greatness by how many people you have under you uh, there, how many people serve you. But God measures greatness and success by how many people we serve. Jesus is here as Lord of heaven and earth, and he is serving there. And if he can serve, then certainly we uh, should be serving uh, as well. A fourth lesson that we can learn from this story is that of happiness. Notice Jesus addresses that in verse 17. He said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. <clears throat> happiness is not in being the greatest uh, or having the most people serve you. People don't usually strive to be unhappy. I'm going to see what I can do to be unhappy today. You know, people strive for happiness. And Jesus says, if you want to be happy, then it involves knowing something. So in my Bible, in verse 17, I circle the word know and I circle the word do. If you know these things, you're not happy just because you know them. Happy are ye if you do them. Remember Muhammad Ali said, I am the greatest of all time. Or Ricky Henderson and uh, stealing bases when he stole third and held it up. And I'm the greatest, you know. And, and so, but that's not what Jesus said that he was about. And that's not what we should be about as well. There must be a knowledge of him and there must be obedience to him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. We sometimes have that characterized in one hymn we sing, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey uh, there. Well, we come to the primary lesson uh, here that Jesus was teaching, and the lesson he was teaching them was that of daily cleansing there. In verse 13, he says, you call me master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. What's the difference in a master and a Lord? Well, the master is the teacher who is to be believed. The Lord is to be obeyed. And so he says, you know these things because I, as your master, am teaching you these things. But you're going to be happy when you do them and you recognize me and obey me as your Lord uh, as well. And so he says in verse 14, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. That word ought, when we use it sometimes, we kind of have the notion of that's a good idea. You, you ought to do that. But that's not what this word means. This word is translated ought in our King James Bible. It means to owe someone, to be indebted, to have an obligation to be bound to it, like we should be bound to our word uh, there. And so we have an obligation. We are indebted because God, the Lord of glory, left that glory. He came to earth and humbled himself because he loved us with an unending love and died for us. And he came not to be served himself, but to be a servant uh, there. 
And so this idea of washing the feet is not a church ordinance. Notice in verse 15 what it says. I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done. It doesn't say do what I have done. Now, those who practice that in their churches, they can do that. It's not uh, a, a sinful thing, of course, and it's not a wrong thing to do. But for those who don't practice it, they haven't disobeyed Scripture either because the Lord is not teaching us that we should have the literal washing of feet. But those who do it, they'll learn these lessons of humility and forgiveness and some of the other things uh, there. But Jesus says, what I have done to you, that do as I have done to you as well. And talks about the daily cleansing. As an example, think about the Old Testament, the furniture and the tabernacle. Whenever the, the priest would come and the people would bring their sacrifices, the first piece of furniture they would come to at the uh, tabernacle was called a brazen altar, the altar of brass. And, and that's where the animals were sacrificed and the blood was shed. And then before the priest would go to the tabernacle, uh, the tent that was there, there was another piece of furniture between the brazen altar and the tabernacle, and it was called the labor. We would think of laboratory uh, there. It was a basin with, with water for cleansing. And when the priest was finished at the altar, he could not go straight into the tabernacle, which was the presence of God. He first had to go to the labor uh, for washing of the hands and feet uh, there. And neither could he come and skip the brazen altar. He couldn't just go to the labor and then go. Because, see, there first had to be the brazen altar, which represents a person coming to Christ for salvation. And the labor represents the believer who's already been to the altar of salvation. They're coming to the labor for daily cleansing. They don't have to go all the way to the altar again of the cross. They go to the labor for daily cleansing. And so that is what God is teaching us uh, here as Jesus is washing uh, the feet. He's telling us that there are two needs among people. There's the need that Judas had. He needed to be wholly washed, but he died without it. And there are others who are already saved. They've been to the brazen altar, but there's some daily cleansing that they need in their lives. And so for us today, we ask ourselves the question, if you're washed, if you've never trusted Christ as Savior, you know that God loves you with an everlasting love, a love that can't be quenched, a love that will never stop. But if you die without receiving that love in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you die like Judas did without the love of God in your life, and you spend eternity in hell as Judas is doing even now. And so for those who are not saved, you come to Christ for salvation. If you're here this morning or watching uh, through YouTube or Facebook there, maybe you're already saved, but that sonship has been established, but that fellowship is not what it ought to be. Then there's that daily cleansing. If we confess our sins, First John says, and the we is talking about Christians. After we've been to the brazen altar, before we can go into the presence of God as priests, because New Testament teaches we're like priests as well, before we can go into God's presence, we must be clean. We have to go to the labor. If we try to bypass that, we're saved, and we're trying to go into God's presence and pray, he says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God's not going to hear me. If I want God to hear me, I need to go to the labor. I need to have that spiritual cleansing, and it's as simple as confessing it to God, and saying, God, I'm sorry, will you cleanse me of this? I've been to the altar, I've been saved, but Lord, there's something in my life that's not clean, that's not pleasing to you, and I ask you to cleanse that because I don't just want a relationship with you, I want fellowship with you. And we can't have that fellowship with God if there's something unclean in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful Father that you are. One of the responsibilities of a father is to teach. And that's what Jesus was doing, teaching about the foot washing and our relationship and our fellowship, our union 
our communion. And Father, regardless of what the spiritual needs are this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would put his finger on each spiritual need and help us not to turn away, but to deal with whatever the Holy Spirit convicts us of this morning because we know that cleansing is just a prayer away. And if we confess our sins, that you are indeed faithful, you're just, and you will forgive us and cleanse us of all of our sins and restore us into the proper fellowship with you. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, 353, would you stand together as we sing, Search Me, O God. And as we sing that song, may that be the prayer of your heart, and you will ask God to search your heart. And if God puts his finger on something in your life that you need, uh, we invite you, if you would like, to come forward and make that right with the Lord. And, of course, you can do that right where you're standing as well. Nathan, number 353, we'll sing just the first stanza together. sinners, Christ died for us. God, that's a love I just cannot fathom. I'm so grateful for it. And Father, help me to never lose the awe and the wonder of that truth. Father, we ask that you would help us to learn the lesson from today's uh, message. Father, as we learn from Peter and his lack and his understanding, and Father, I pray that we would learn those lessons and that we would learn to love you with our actions and our words and our thoughts and everything that we do, Father. Father, I pray that we would share that love with others, that we would, in this room with everybody that we come across, that we would share the gospel, the truth of your love with everybody. Father, we ask that you would be magnified and glorified in our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 